The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. My name is Mark Olson. Our topic today is filling, purging, and maintaining system pressure in a hydronic system. Now, I'll be your presenter today, and through the course of the next 40, 45 minutes, I guess that's how long this will last, I'll be using schematics and actual installation photographs to help convey the topic at hand, that being filling, purging, and maintaining pressure. But those topics should be looked on uh, with an even greater list of things to do when it comes to commissioning the fill of a hydronic system. So I'm going to touch base on each of those as we walk through here today. But let me just mention them briefly. Firstly, pressure testing the system. We have a system that's been put, put together. We want to make sure that it is sound mechanically from a holding pressure standpoint. Purging out any solid debris. That's our first first word of first time we use the word purge. Chemically cleaning the, to remove any oils and greases and, and even scale for older systems. Next step is to drain and rinse the cleaning solution from the system. It's important to get those chemicals out of this system. And then we're ready for fill. Fill. And as we fill, ideally, we want to purge as much air as possible out of the system as the fluid is coming into the system. Next is pressurizing the system, as well as pressurizing the expansion tank. We'll talk about that. And then if any inhibitor is desired, adding that and then maintaining pressure. Now, we're going to talk about, as far as maintaining pressure, three different ways of maintaining pressure. And uh, we'll walk through each of those examples towards the end there. Okay. Pressure testing. So our first step. So we have the system put together. It's um, tight, at least we think it is. So let's pressure test before we do anything. So you can pressure test using air. You can pressure test using water. Either one will work. But we advocate air whenever possible. Why? Because if there's a leak, it can be you know uh, quickly repaired. No sense of no need to drain the system and dry it out especially if you are using sweat fittings, for example. But you can use water. Just make sure that uh, if you're testing in cold climates that you don't have the potential for freezing. And off to the right there, um, you can see a little fitting. Let me point to it here. A simple Schrader valve that can be made to put into a nipple to put on your purge port. A quick access for your compressor to get in and uh, test the uh, integrity. So the steps would be, well, first of all, make sure you close off all the areas where air can escape to, um, including the caps on your automatic air vents and on top of your automatic separators. Close them down tight as well as any purge ports. Now, your PRV outlet uh, suggest uh, plugging that out. I say temporarily because you want to reverse that process when it comes time to firing the system on. and now you're ready to uh, to uh, compress the system. Now, what do you test to? Well, if you don't have a specification, we suggest 150% the rating of the PRV. So if your PRV is, say, um, 30 PSI, uh, you might want to test to 45 PSI or, or 50 PSI. Okay. And hold for 15 minutes anyway, uh, maybe up to 30 minutes. Um, if your um, system is subject to either very hot or very cold temperatures, um, and you want it to stabilize um, after you fill the system compressed, uh, say, to 50 PSI. If it's, um, if it's going to be cooled down, that pressure might decay a little bit. Let it stabilize first, then take a look at it, and you want to wait 15 to 30 minutes to um, make sure there isn't any further decay. If there isn't, you're good to go. If there is, you need to go back in and try to find out, obviously, where those leaks are. And dishwasher detergent uh, solution in a spray bottle can go a long way to adding, so it being a tool for you to look for those telltale bubbles indicating a leak on a, on a suspected joint that is um, leaking. Okay, so we've tested the system. It's good now from a pressure standpoint and time to flush out any solid debris. I say solid because we'll get into liquids in a second. Solid debris. So this is obviously important for retrofits, but it, but new systems too. Uh, it's not uncommon to find, well, look at the left side. Uh, it's a picture of a new system, basically, that's been uh, purged. Um, and uh, you can see the remnants of shavings from copper if you look down into the bottom of that white bucket. Um, and then on the right-hand side, obviously, an older system that's had the, you know, the sediment that's um, settled out and uh, 
you will get uh, scale and uh, corrosion effects that will be um, basically in your system that you want to get out. So metal chips, shavings, even casting sand you'll find, dust of different types, insects, and, and the like. Here's a photograph from Hot Rod Roar uh, indicating even more things that lurk inside, as he says. On the left-hand side, various types of sealants, uh, cutting oil. On the right-hand side, uh, shavings uh, of uh, from different types of piping materials, whether polymer or, or metal, is uh, found in even new systems. So from a piping arrangement standpoint, when we're speaking about flushing and filling for that matter, there's a couple of different ways to go. You can see two um, schematic, if you will, segments here. But what they have in common between this one and this one is we have a port of entry, our fill port. We have our purge port. And in between some method of blocking off so that we can control the flow of fluids as we would like up through here, up through our part of our system, back down and back through here. The difference between this one and this one is this is a check valve and this is a ball valve. They both work equally well as it relates to filling and purging. Okay, And uh, we'll get into some schematics of an entire system, but the idea here is that we might not have just one set of film purge valves. We might have a more complicated system that might require several of these pairs, and you want to uh, uh, divide and conquer, if you will, those type of systems. Isolate the rest of the system, fill and purge a part of a system, get that done, and go on down the line. Now, when it comes to flushing uh, debris, the velocity needed in a pipe is about five to six feet per second average pipe velocity. To do a good job of entraining and, 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 and burping that uh, debris out of the system effectively. So uh, as an example, a one inch pipe will require anywhere from 13 to 17 gallons per minute, approximately, just to, to push things along. Okay. Now, before I leave this slide here, um, some manufacturers such as Calefi offer a fill purge valve that's all one piece, which is convenient. Uh, we offer them in smaller sizes. I believe it's up to one inch, but uh, uh, other manufacturers have this type of approach as well. Now, the question might be, okay, five to six uh, feet per second is what I need. What is that in gallons per minute? Well, um, online calculators such as this uh, could answer the question real quickly for you. You know you want five to six uh, feet per second. You have a one inch pipe and uh, you can play around with the flow rate and you can see that 13 gallons per minute through that one inch pipe will give you the, the needed velocity in order to purge uh, the system of debris. Okay, so cleaning the system is next. And, and we do this because oil and greases can survive even heavy flushes. Okay, so you can push the solids along, but the, the, uh, the greases and oils can stay in place. And you don't want those in place because you want them you want them to not react with any other chemicals that might get added one and number two they're just not good for the, even the water if it's a straight water system to mix so you want to get rid of them and examples of um, sources of oils and greases is thread cutting oils as we saw earlier uh, residual soldering flux uh, machining oil and the, and the like now, many manufacturers um, for their cleaning solutions, if you will, um, also are formulated. They formulate their cleaners to also remove scale. And here's a section from a flat plate heat exchanger, and you can see the effects of scale as well as debris that has built up on the inside of this heat exchanger, basically plugging it. Okay, so um, older systems are subject to this, uh, such as this. Uh, system over here with the flat plate heat exchanger you see off to the right. And so you want to take advantage of the cleaning process to also get rid of and dissolve any scale. So your steps in cleaning would look something like this. Oh, we have our, our cleaning uh, chemicals. Uh, this is Romar's version, okay. And we want to have some means of um, pumping our cleaning solution into and back out of, of our system. And so pumping carts such as this one from Calefi do the job. And so we first start by putting our cleaning solution of the concentration required or desired uh, in the pumping cart. We turn on the pump. We have our uh, valve ice, uh, closed off here. So we're gonna send fluid up through here and back around. Now when it comes to cleaning, oftentimes faster flow is better than slower flow. And so to help assist this pump that's down here in the cart 
to send flow through the system quickly, you can turn on your system circulators and speed the process along, for example. Now the circulation time in cleaning manufacturers typically will say one hour. Um, so one hour uh, cleaning. Older systems, longer obviously. Uh, even systems that have been quite scaled may require up to even a week of circulating a cleaning solution. So when you're done, done cleaning, uh, turn off the pump and then open up your valves and, and, and gravity drain the cleaning fluid into pails. And you wanna get as much of the fluid out as possible of these cleaning chemicals. Um, if you're going to come back in and later on after filling the system add inhibitors, some manufacturers, the clean, cleaning chemicals can be compatible with the inhibitors and maybe there isn't as much of a need to get every drop of cleaning solution out, but it's always a good practice to try to get as much out as possible and use compressed air in that, um, in, along those lines uh, to help you do so and blow it out just as you would say winterizing at your house or, or, or a cabin for the, for the winter, okay? Now, we're ready to fill the system. And uh, if uh, the question is, what are, you, what are you going to fill it with? Uh, you might want to fill it with a glycol solution for antifreeze. You might want to fill it with straight water. So if you're filling with straight water, the question is, is the water available on site from the building suitable for fill? Is it sufficient quality? And a quick test using a TDS meter, such as you see of the Kalefi one here being demonstrated, it also does pH testing as well. But when it comes to water quality for fill, TDS is your main measurement. pH is lesser so because in a hydronic system, pH uh, values tend to stabilize. Um, and so we're looking for TDS as total dissolved solids, and that's a measure of how conductive your water is, okay, and vice versa. So some manufacturers of componentry, such as a boiler or a heat pump, might indicate that, for example, um, they don't want the hardness of the water to be greater than seven grains, and translated into parts per million, I think that's around um, 17, about 100, 120 uh, ppm. And so anything less than 120 ppm, say, would be probably sufficient for that um, system if the critical component is the boiler, which oftentimes it typically is, all right? If you have a, a measurement of 400 parts per million or something like that, uh, then you have su sufficient, you have a large amount of dissolved solids in your water that either if it's hardest, it's gonna scale out on your heat exchanger or if it's some other dissolved mineral, it could at a minimum increase the conductivity and the rate of corrosion within the system, especially if you have any ferrous components such as uh, iron pipe, okay? So if your water quality in is, is sufficient, let's start with is sufficient, the, the pressure in order to fill the system uh, may be suitable, uh, sufficient um, right there on site. No need for a pumping cart, but if not, use a pumping cart. And there's many available in the marketplace. Here's the, the Kalefi Hydro Flush pumping cart, little giant, um, big systems such as an engine driven system here like Purge Right are also available to uh, the market. Now for smaller jobs, uh, pumps uh, of one six to one third horsepower typically are, are sufficient. Even a swimming pool pump, which you can get easily up to six or uh, two horsepower, uh, can be used. Okay. Now, when you um, fill the system, many systems are pretty simple. In fact, you can even fill them at a very slow rate and not have any risk of air getting trapped anywhere just because of the design of the system. There's no uh, buffer tanks that could trap air. There's no bending of pipes that go up over back down where air can accumulate in and the like. And, um, but other systems aren't quite that simple. And so the idea when you fill is you wanna fill at a sufficiently high enough flow rate that you kind of minimize any trapped air pockets in the system. And where you suspect air pockets can be trapped in the system easily is an ideal place to put an automatic air vent. So as an example, in the top of a buffer tank, or say in a high rise uh, with your risers going up uh, several floors uh, and then branching out to various uh, emitters, at the top of those riser pipes would be an ideal place to put an automatic air vent, an automatic get rid of air that otherwise would be trapped. Other places, such as you see here, this 
uh, radiator. Uh, it doesn't look so good at a minimum they have an automatic air vent sitting on the top of, an, uh, of a radiator, right? But radiators typically have manual air vent uh, ports and Cleffy makes manual air vents that uh, quickly can purge any remaining air on top of the uh, of the um, radiator off. Now, before I move on from this slide, and I'm going to talk about the right side too, but um, uh, any air that's left in your system after filling, okay, and you're ready to commission the system, will 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 end up becoming absorbed by the water, and the and as it does the makeup water will come in replenishing that. Okay, that's fine and dandy, but you're bringing in more makeup water, okay? So let me explain. Uh, air in the pot, air up here, your automatic air separators are going to do what? They're going to get rid of any uh, gases in solution, okay? And that's done by heating the water up, uh, the bubbles coalesce, they, they get pushed out. And as water loses its dissolved gases, it becomes hungry for more. And so trap pockets like you see in the top of a radiator ultimately is going to be absorbed by the water. The water is going to displace the uh, trap pockets, and uh, but we've brought in more makeup water. And a lot of times we want to minimize, in fact, always, almost, in fact, we should always minimize any makeup water, okay? Uh, off to the right here is a manual air vent that also works automatically and it's called a hydroscopic air vent from Kalefi. It's great in these applications where you can both manually burp any air off and then turn it clockwise and it works automatically by way of swelling uh, discs that are stacked inside of that air vent. If you have an interest, uh, you can find more information from us uh, online on how that air vent works. Okay, now we're ready to fill, all right? So we see in this diagram here our same fill and purge port arrangement. And, uh, but in this case, our water quality is poor. And so we might wanna demineralize it, in which case we see a hot rod over here demineralizing a system using the same arrangement you see in the schematic over here. So we're gonna, going to use the pressure that's available from our mains, our water mains in the facility, run it through a hose into the bottom of this demineralizer cart, and there's several of these available in the marketplace, including Cleffy's, as you see here, as the water, hard water, uh, and also water laden with any other dissolved minerals, such as iron. Uh, as the water goes up, this demineralizer will pull those pollutants, if you will, out of the water, and the exiting water is completely demineralized, basically mm, distilled, if you will. It's um, has no dissolved solids. And now we're entering that into the system and we're filling the system through a demineralizer cart, okay? Now, if you don't have sufficient pressure to do this and you um, want to boost the rate of fill, especially for getting rid of any air, you can first demineralize the water into some other temporary holding reservoir and then or, or a pump cart, and they use the pump cart to fill the, fill the system, okay? And here's an example of that process. This is a larger commercial system, and we can see these guys have, um, they put the system together, they've pressure tested, they've purged it, and now they're getting ready to, to fill. And what they're doing is using a demineralizing cart to, to build up a supply of water, demineralized water, of sufficient quantity so that when they get done and they get ready to fill the system, they'll use the pump cart here from Kleppe to, at a high rate, uh, fill the system as well as, yeah, basically to fill the system, okay? Okay, so now we're ready to um, uh, pressurize the system. Now we've filled the system, now we have to bring the pressure up, and we'll talk about why. But before we go any further, um, before beginning, your um, pressurization process and, and your filling process for that matter, make sure your PRV is unplugged. That's that reversing of that process we talked about in the second or third slide. <laughs> okay, and you bent, your vent caps are loosened and your separator caps are loosened because now they can work automatically and as water builds up underneath them and, the, and, and it gets pressurized, the air ahead of them gets burped right out of those automatic air vents. And your expansion tank should be charged, its pressure should be charged before you connect it up to the system. Meaning, uh, if you want 40 PSI in your system, pre-charge your expansion tank to match that 40 PSI, okay? 
Why is this important? Well, let's say you want 40 PSI in your system and your expansion tank comes out of the factory pre-charged to say 15 PSI. And let's say before you have pressurized your system, filled and pressurized your system, you spun the expansion tank, you connected to the system, opened up your isolation valve between your expansion tank and the system, all right? And as you pressurize the system, you also were pressurizing the expansion tank, okay? The system will come up to 40 PSI, but what you have done now is you've basically disabled largely the function of that expansion tank. It has the, the, the acceptance volume, if you will, is minimal. The amount of uh, expansion and contraction available in that expansion tank to accommodate the uh, heating cycle as a system heats and cools, it doesn't have the ability to absorb those uh, potential pressure changes. And as, re as a result, your pressure will change. It will fluctuate up and down and maybe excessively. So pre-charge your expansion tank before uh, you connect it up to the system, okay? An accurate gauge is important. And uh, if you don't fill your pressure uh, high enough for the boiler to be happy, the boiler can go out, uh, go on um, boiler lockout, okay? And then excessive fill pressure, on the other hand, can trip your relief valve, and that's not fun for anyone. Your pressure relief valve on your boiler or wherever it is in the system, spill water all over the floor. Customers don't like that, obviously, and either do contractors having to attend to it. Okay, so now we're going to pressurize our system. It's filled, um, and we're going to now bring it up to the pressure that we desire. Now, we're, we want to, we're interested now in static pressure, not dynamic. Dynamic pressure is what, what happens in the system once um, a pump turns on. So our pressure is dynamic in that case. We want to set our pressure, uh, the static pressure of the system. And our goal is to achieve at least five PSI at our highest air vents, okay? And five PSI gives us enough buffer for the inevitable uh, slight changes in uh, calculations and stuff. Five PSI is a good safety factor. Is 10 PSI okay? Yeah, it typically is. But you wanna make sure that you don't go below zero because if you go below zero pressure, basically slightly vacuum, if you will, then your system now becomes an open system and air can come in through those open air vents and air separators into your system. And that's what you don't want to have happen, okay? Now, keep in mind that for every foot of water height column, it's equal to 0.433 PSI. So as an example, on the left-hand side here, we see 10 feet of water column generates at the bottom of that column, 4.33 PSI. So that takes us to, our first method of pressurizing a system, and that is using the pressure available in our water mains, sending it through a backflow preventer and a fill valve to pressurize a system. And here's an example. We have a contractor down here. He used a, a Calefi auto fill valve. We got the backflow preventer right here. So our water mains comes in through the backflow preventer, through the fill valve and out into our system. Okay, and our goal is to achieve at least five PSI at the highest air vents. In this case, we got air vents sitting up here, maybe uh, so many levels uh, above the mechanical room, all right? And if we have a 30 foot vertical height difference between these automatic air vents and where he is filling at, then the pressure that he's going to want to set his automatic fill valve to is an easy calculation. 30 feet here times 0.433 PSI per feet, per foot, <laughs> plus five PSI safety factor. It gives us 18 PSI. So the contractor just takes a screwdriver, dials in 18 PSI uh, in advance on his automatic fill valve here, open up his valve, and it quickly uh, goes into a fast fill mode and then shuts off automatically at 18 PSI. Okay, pretty simple. Now this, um, if you haven't seen the Calefia auto fill valve before, it's uh, pretty popular in the marketplace. And um, here is a performance chart that we did just to convince ourselves that we have a pretty good valve. We took the Calefia auto fill valve here, and uh, in green is the line, okay? And what we're, what we're measuring is uh, flow rate uh, as a function of the system pressure. And then we're doing a comparison of the Calefi Autofill to a major brand in the marketplace doing the same. And that's indicated by this blue and fuchsia colored line. Now, why is there two lines? Well, unlike the Calefi automatic 
autofill, this type of pressure reducing valve has a lever. And so during the early part of the filling process, the lever is flipped so that there's basically a straight through fill of the, through the pressure reducing valve. It's like the pressure re reducing valve isn't even there. And at some time, a contractor has to come in as a system is filling and put it into pressure reduction mode, which slows down the flow rate dramatically, but it'll cause it to shut off automatically as well. But it's a manual process. The long and short of it is our test was done with a 30 PSI inlet pressure. So coming into the valve is 30 PSI. Okay. And we set the uh, pressure on the autofill to 15 PSI as we did the competitor. Okay. And you can see as we started the fill process, the Calefi autofill was at 5.3 gallons per minute versus 3.4 for the competitor. And as the system filled and pressure built up 0246 and ended at the 15 PSI, you can see at, at all times the Calefi autofill was significantly faster in filling, even actually it's 50% faster. So it's a long way of saying it's a set it and forget it type of valve. So the configurations that Clefie makes this autofill valve is in several different configurations. The valve itself, whether it's a half inch valve or a three quarter inch autofill valve, or in combination with backflow preventers of different types, a dual check type backflow preventer, a testable reduced pressure zone type backflow preventer, uh, both half inch and three quarter inch. So back to the um, double check type backflow preventer and the autofill. Here's a cross section of this product. This is the autofill portion and this is the backflow proportion. It has an internal screen, which is important because any debris that comes through here and gets through the backflow preventer uh, doesn't have any chance to cause problem with the diaphragm up here. It's set it and forget it. Adjustable set point with top screw as we saw in that earlier slide. And if it needs a uh, servicing, this cartridge just spins off pretty easily. Uh, an optional PSI pressure gauge here to measure the system pressure as the system's filling has become more and more popular, and an integrated shutoff valve down here in the bottom of the valve. The backflow preventer is a dual check atmosphere vent type rated to or approved to ASSC 1012, and it's third party uh, tested and certified uh, for low lead, meeting uh, NSF 372 standards. Now, um, here is that same backflow preventer, a little bit more colorful of a photograph. And uh, it, this, this was to convey the issue of water hammer. Now, in a home, water hammer can do a couple of things. And one of them is it causes the backflow preventer to leak. And how does it do that? Well, let's talk about how these backflow preventers work, all right? When we have a system that is being filled, okay, the mains pressure coming from this side closes this piece, this shuttle here, if you will, and the shuttle is being held open by this fairly loose spring. It doesn't take much pressure. So the first thing happens is this shuttle transfers and this flat washer over here mates with its, uh, call it um, the edge on this side basically giving us a watertight passageway straight through the valve, through each of these check valves, into our fill valve and into the system, okay? But what can happen with a water hammer is it can cause this valve to uh, chatter a little bit, just, just very momentarily back off its seat. And if we have any type of debris that could, in that process, get, get caught in here, maybe a small grain of sand, from that point forward, we can get slight dripping of our backflow preventer. So we always advise, don't send it back in. It's working just fine. It just needs to be cleaned out as Hot Rod is showing how he did it here in, in his shop. Uh, quickly, it can be taken apart and cleaned out with its union connections, et cetera. Now to prevent that back from um, uh, uh, the water hammer to begin with, uh, many, many arresters or um, shock arresters can be used uh, to reduce that uh, hammer effect. Let's take a look at an installation photograph of a, um, oop, back it up, of a autofill combo assembly. We can see it down here from Mr. Dwayne Burdick of uh, Ohio, uh, submitted on Calefi Excellence. And so we can see what he's doing. Um, if we can study this, we have water coming in here, mains coming down through our backflow preventer and into our autofill and up into the system. Okay. 
and we can see that more than likely, even though we can't see it on the photograph, he probably has an expansion tank connected over here, which is a common practice, both the fill valve and the expansion tank connected under, under the bottom of an air separator. It doesn't have to be, but it's, it's convenient. And then on the backflow preventer being drained down per code within six inches of the, of the uh, floor. Nice job from Mr. Burdick. Now, sometimes people will fill uh, the system with an autofill um, combo, all right, but the water quality isn't sufficient for use, and they will on site uh, demineralize the system. So, this is Tim Peterson of Cardinal Heating and Air Conditioning, a contractor not so far from Kalefi here. He was featured in a magazine article, and so he's taking advantage of the head re uh, produced by the system. Uh, by the pumps in the system to create the flow needed to after he's filled the system um, and it's now got hard water in it he wants to now demineralize it he runs those pumps creating the differential pressure to send flow up through the demineralizer back into the system so basically he's scrubbing the system of hard water now the question is okay he leaves and may, perhaps there's some makeup water which is going to be what hard so Cleffy offers in that cat in that situation an autofill combo, but in this in this case with a demineralizer cartridge in between. So it has the same resin inside of here as it does here. It just it takes care of any makeup requirements for the system, so that as the system goes on and on and on, you have if there's any makeup water, it is treated as well. Okay, autofill combos that have a higher degree of protection type backflow for a venter called a ASSC 1013. Now, not 1012, 1013. These are reduced pressure principle type backflow for venters. Here is the uh, photographs of the assembly and a, and a cross section of what they look like. Um, they're half inch from Kalefi, half inch and three quarter MPT. And I'm going to put, I'm going to emphasize press. Press is becoming more and more popular on all of our products. Most of our products have press connections up to two inch. And so we offer that also in this arrangement. Uh, integral shutoff valves over here. And unlike our competition or much of our competition, the uh, air gap for the drain is uh, included down here. Now a little trivia for you. In Europe, they would call this a tundish. First time I was in a meeting and they referred to a tundish, I thought they weren't talking right. <laughs> but it's uh, what we would call an air gap. And these also are third-party low lead certified to uh, NSF 372. Now, this is another, uh, this is our three-quarter inch uh, uh, ASSC 1013 backflow preventer. I'm not going to go through the details of this. Uh, we'll save that for a later webinar. We're going to have an expert on backflow preventer uh, technology uh, as a guest later on in 2018 on Coffee with Kalefi. So be on the lookout for that. And speaking of backflow prevention, uh, we found it was uh, somewhat humorous that the, the American Backflow Prevention Association has a, even their own comic book. <laughs> so we thought that was uh, quite novel. Okay. Um, so here's an example of a schematic. Let's take a look at this. We got a few things going on here. So let me give you kind of the, the groundwork here. So we have a, um, a air to water heat pump over here. Okay, so we, we're converting, we're taking the energy from the air in the system, converting it and sending it as a water, as fluid into the building. Okay, now this is going to be glycol. It's going to be heat exchanged. So this is our glycol loop. Okay, over here we have our backup or our, our uh, system side. Okay, and so we have <clears throat> a buffer tank and we have probably things going on down here. Here's our autofill assembly here. But notice the generous usage of fill and purge valves here and here, 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 drain valve down here on the buffer tank, okay? And um, so we'll, we'll talk about that, but let's say that we're going to fill the system. So firstly, over here, we have our glycol loop. Well, it's a pretty straightforward uh, system, not too many places where air to get uh, caught in. So a simple little fill purge arrangement like you see here, we could, um, we could uh, fill here and then purge here. So this is pretty straightforward and pressurize it accordingly, whatever the spec is for that side of the system. Over on our water side here, you can see where the installer has put an isolation of purge valve here and a purge valve here. Whenever you have sediment, a large amount of sediment in your in your system and you want to 
purge it. You don't. You want to try to minimize that sediment or debris going through your critical components. Perhaps it's your pumps or your heat exchangers. There's a very tight passage through those heat exchangers. You don't want to clog them up with with junk. So the contractor, his process for filling and purging might be to isolate these valves right here, his isolation valve, and 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 basically purge in this direction. Okay preventing any type of debris getting pushed into these critical components. The tank might have received a lot of sediment, and so he might want to then also purge here and out here to push any debris that's settled into the bottom of this uh, buffer tank, okay? And over here, he might have a um, radiant system or a, a secondary that has sec uh, several zones. Now, how do you how do you fill and purge then? Well, the idea is to divide and conquer. So I'm going to take this radiant manifold here as an example, being driven by this pump. And what we want to do then is we want to take advantage of all of the isolation valves mounted on the manifold itself, and one loop at a time, purge and fill it. So we would start off with this five port, five uh, circuit manifold, closing off four of the circuits, as well as the closing it off from the the, the, the uh, system. Close these valves off. Take our pump, pump into one side, and then drain into the bucket here until we see no more bubbles if we're filling, and then we um, turn the pump off close those off, open up another one, and we just go right on down the line. That way we maximize the average pipe velocity through each of those circuits, minimizing the chance of any air bubbles to be left in our radiant system. Okay, this takes us to maintaining pressure method number two. Okay, number one was using um, the mains pressure on site, going through a backflow for venter and a fill valve. Now you might not have the ability or desire to go use the water mains. So you can use what's called hydronic system feeders. And there's at least, mm, I don't know, two, three, four of these on the market, at least brands. Here's two of them, good companies. We see uh, a hydronic system feeder over here on this job up in Moorfield, Ontario. This happens to be a chicken farm. It was submitted in on Calefi Excellence or Brandon Gleason. Okay, so it's disconnected. The hydronic system is disconnected from the plumbing side and the pressure is maintained by way of this hydronic system feeder. These have a pump and a pressure switch built in so that if there's any drop in pressure in the system, any type of call it makeup needs, the feeder will sense that by way of the pressure switch, kick on the pump, the pump will pump more glycol mixture into the system and keeping your system pressurized. And here's another version over here from Califactio up in the other side of Canada <clears throat> on a job submitted by Colby O'Neill on Calafi Excellence. This is up in Saskatoon. The more, the higher you go up in North America, obviously the more prevalent glycol systems are because of the cold weather. And these are two examples from Canada using these hydronic system feeders, okay, because they need glycol. The third and final method we'll talk about is maintaining, and probably not as prevalent of the fir as first two, in fact, I'm almost positive, is using a second expansion tank. Okay, let's take a look at one of those installations. So here we have a hydronic system. Here's our main expansion tank, okay, as we would always use. But <clears throat> what's been done here is a second expansion tank has been added. The Second expansion tank before connecting up to the system has been charged with fluid, in this case water, because of the water system, but it could have been glycol, to 80 psi. And then between the expansion tank and autofill valve to maintain the pressure in the system, just as mains would do, as well as a pressure gauge, just to see how much pressure and that we're maintaining the 80 psi over here and say this might be 15 PSI over here, controlled by the autofill valve, okay? Very novel way of doing it. If you don't have the ability to have mains or desire the ability of mains, pressure, water onto your hydronic system, this is another way of doing it. Okay, now a couple of last slides. Air vents. Refrain from purging water out of air vents. Why? It loses the protective air cushion 
and you can get some debris up into the needle valve seat area. So let's take a look at that. This is a cross section of an automatic air vent, in this case, Calefi. You can see blue here is the water and white is the air cushion I'm referring to, okay? And the way, and this valve is in a closed position, meaning um, there's um, no air passing up through here. I can tell that because uh, if air bubbles were to accumulate in top of the air vent, the float would drop with the increased um, depth of the air cushion, and then the linkage would open up this little needle valve, and because the system's under pressure, the air would get burped out. Okay, that's how automatic air vents work. But this finely ground needle valve, a very shiny uh, surface here with the uh, O-ring, is uh, very important for us from a reliability standpoint. So if you were to push, remove the cap and push this little valve right here, you can do that. You can cause this uh, valve to burp you would push all the air out with the water behind it. And if you have any debris sitting up here, which we like to protect from the needle valve, it can get up here and cause the valve to, um, it will still work just fine, but you might have remnant debris up here, which causes the valve to weep. And no, you don't have a defective valve. You have some debris that's got caught up here, sometimes by way of burping the air vent. So we say, don't do that unless you absolutely have to, okay? Now, we talked about chemicals earlier in inhibitors, and uh, Calefi offers a cleaner and inhibitor treatment kit. Basically, it's sold with our very popular dirt mag, magnetic dirt sap separators. You see a photograph here. And this is an aerosol type of uh, chemical kit. It has both a cleaner and then an, an inhibitor and it's injected into the system by way of uh, a um, garden hose type connection like we have in the bottom of our uh, dirt mags. So a very popular way of now adding chemicals. You see more and more manufacturers, and we don't make these chemicals. We uh, These are Romar, and we advertise as such. Very proven, very high quality um, producer of both cleaning and inhibiting chemicals for the hydronic industry. To see before we get into the, the remaining slides here, back to Kevin, if you've got any questions for me, Kevin, coming in or have been submitted. Hey, Mark, can you hear me? Perfectly. Yes, we do have a we do have a few questions. How about this one? How do you keep the pressure in a geothermal system with antifreeze considering the wide swing and temperature? Hmm. Okay, very good. Well, the ground loops of a geothermal system is a closed system just as on the other side of the heat pump, it's a closed system exposed to wide swings in temperature as well. And on the, on the system side, you would use an expansion tank to maintain that pressure. So on the loop side, we advocate doing the same. Having an expansion tank sized appropriately for the volume and the temperature changes expected in your ground loops placed on on the system and thereby stabilizing the pressure that he's alluding to in that question okay great there's another question here does a heating system with 50 percent propylene glycol have a special startup procedure due to the high viscosity um what 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 about that one oh it, it, well certainly 50 percent glycol is going to have it's going to have two things it's going to be more dense than water and it's going to be much more viscous thicker so um, outside of that, as it relates to filling, uh, I can't think of too much different other than you need much more pumping power to deliver that average velocity, that purging velocity that you want in a system to and, and train air. And, um, and so it's basically needing more horsepower to get the job done as I see it. Okay, good, thanks. Here's a good one. I like this. How important is it to use soft water in system filling and flushing? How important is it to use soft water? In system? Um, okay, good question. Um, there's nothing special about using soft water as it relates to um, flushing. It doesn't have any special properties that aids in carrying away debris. And so from that standpoint, I wouldn't advise soft water to do that. Now, 
if you are planning to have your final fill, you fill the system with soft water, then you might find it more convenient to use soft water in order to do your, your, your flushing. And, uh, and so in that case, um, I, I would advocate doing so. Now, the question might be, well, I'm going to use soft water, but is it a problem to flush my system with just tap water, basically hard water, if you will? And the question, is, the, the answer to that is, you're typically going to be okay. Uh, you're going to dilute that software so, so small, slightly, to make much an effect if you do a good job of making sure the system gets drained before your final fill. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, here's another one. I think you may have covered this, but how to remove air from difficult loops, for example, maybe a poorly designed or installed loop? Um, poorly designed or installed loop. Okay. Well, I think <clears throat> the best thing to do is uh, take advantage of any ports that are on either side of the area that there is entrained air, meaning you want to minimize any flow restriction in other parts of the system and thus maximizing the ability to to flush that air out. It's about as good I can good of an answer I can think of without mm, there being specifics of the job that enter into the answer. So <clears throat> that's that would be my advice. And I guess it goes to point out, you know, good design on the front end is, is important uh, for making sure that uh, any entrapped, entrained air is uh, is minimized. Okay, good. Well, here, here's one that just came in. Um, how do you use the hydrofill to fill a system with glycol in it? Assume 35% glycol. So, so how do you use the hydrofill if you're going to use glycol? So this is what the question is referring to, and this is Kalepi's demineralizer. And so, firstly, um, when you use glycol, if you don't, if you have concentrated glycol, and you're mixing to 50/50, you want to make sure that the water that you're mixing it with is is demineralized water. Glycol wants demineralized water. It doesn't want to have any additives that can impact the characteristics of the chemicals in that glycol. Okay. So <clears throat> the way you would take advantage of the hydrophil in using glycol is that you would um, let's say you needed 100 gallons you'd run 50 gallons of water through the hydrophil here 50 gallons mix it with 50 gallons of glycol that has your 100 gallons now at 50 percent concentration and now you need a means of getting it into the system you can use uh, one of several um, flush carts, if you will, available on the market, including Clefi, where now you can you can pump that glycol from. So you pour the glycol into the flush cart, and then now with your system already, you know, tested, uh, cleaned, and drained, you can now fill your system with glycol. And um, other, the other point I want to make, though, along those lines is sometimes it's asked, um, can I take old glycol? you know, or compromised glycol. It's been in the system, I want to clean it up. And uh, I, I think I got some hard water mixed in with this. Can I run that glycol through the Kalefi um, demineralizer? And uh, well, you could run it through, but it's not going to do the job. And so if you got bad glycol, there's nothing you can really do once it gets terribly bad, but to replace it completely. Okay, thanks. Here's a good one. This just came in from Tim on the Saskatoon mm -hmm. glycol feeding slide. Can you go back up to that that picture of the project that has um, uh, the question? Mm -hmm. Is it shows an autofill valve on the line out of the tank to that system? Why would you do that when the glycol feeder can control the pressure? Uh, right here. I th uh, is that the Saskatoon <laughs> slide? Uh, I think so, and it does look like a pressure reducing valve. It's not an autofill, but it might be someone else's pressure reducing valve. And uh, yeah, I that's suppose, it. Mm -hmm, uh, without talking to Colby, and I'm just going to hazard a guess here, if there's um, if there need need to have redundant pressure control, for example, um, if this is delivering, if this is set to del if he wants <clears throat> 15 psi in the system at all times. 
and uh, this is generating uh, something north of 15. He can say 20, set this at 15 psi, and now he's going to be able to accomplish using a pressure reducing valve to stabilize the system with this makeup package. That would be the only thing I can think of, unless that perhaps might not even be a pressure reducing valve. Good question, yeah. though. Nice, nice eye. Yeah. <laughs> it looks like it. Good eye. And um, I guess that glycol fill system has a pressure switch in it, so maybe it's just for safety or redundancy. I don't know. It could, could be redundancy. Yeah. I don't see it would hurt. I'm not sure if it's needed, but yeah. I guess we'd have to talk to Colby. Yeah. And the the uh, the question about the five psi is that a static you know at the highest point in the system is that a static uh pressure or is that with the system running you want it with static uh, you wouldn't want to put cold water in and do that uh, you want it at room temperature water and uh, it's a pressurized now the five psi is just basically giving you the added safety factor above zero that you want to make sure um, an automatic air vent is going to vent the air out effectively. Having said that, <clears throat> if you think about a system, let's go back down to, uh, uh, we can take any system here. That's probably not a good one, but a, a, an air vent in the top of your system, which is what we're talking about, so you see in the second uh, somewhere, <clears throat> is um, if you have your primary side of your system working, it's not even going to see that up there. It's going to be completely separated of any pumping effects on the, pri on the primary side. Okay. So <clears throat> I'd say in, in, in most cases, the air vent might not even know the system. In many cases, the air vent might not even know if the system's on or not, but we're talking static. Right, okay. I think we have time for one more. Now, um, this one, I, I, uh, I don't know if we have the answer, but let me read it. When pressure testing with air, won't an ambient temperature drop cause a pressure drop in the system, which might look like a leak in the system? Is nitrogen a better means for pressure testing? So the, the point is, would um, the cooling off during that 15 to 30 minutes that we referred to as the time to watch any pressure decay, if during that time, the ambient air that you use for pressure testing is subject to cold, uh, cold and the air uh, as a result contracts and causing the pressure to decay, um, then, uh, well, once the air, I guess the point would be um, that air, once it, once it cools off um, at that cold, now cold temperature, it should stop. It shouldn't continue once it comes up the temperature at stable temperature. <clears throat> and uh, it won't take long for air to cool off if it is subject to such cold temperatures. So I would not advocate using any type of gas other than air. Okay. Well, I don't have any more questions, Mark, uh, unless you have anything else. Uh, we're at one minute after one. So um, anything else you can think oh. of before we go? Yeah, I looked at a question that came in earlier is regarding uh, glycol feeders about someone getting requested to have, to use glycol feeders or pumping packages but with a large enough pump for initial fill to the system, is that a good idea? And let's just go back for the viewers to understand the question a little bit better. So from here, all right, so the question would be, should these be oversized with, should these have larger pumps so that in addition to being able to maintain system pressure, they also can be used for filling the system to begin with because these don't have very large pumps, I think he's referring to. And I would say that that might be overkill. It'd be kind of a one and done type thing because now after having um, put, put that system in and filled it, you have a very large pump, probably at a large cost that is never going to be really needed again. You're not going to require a large pump. So I wouldn't suggest that that would be a good idea. And okay. uh, let's see, let's see. Here's here. one more Another one question. is, okay. Uh, how do you detect a bad diaphragm tank? How do you detect a bad diaphragm tank? Okay, so so an expansion tank that's having its um, diaphragm um, start to to die. Uh, one of the telltale signs would be um, you on your pressure uh, relief valve on your boiler. 
because your uh, diaphragm is bad, it's now going to start, um, um, it could even break, if you will, and thereby you wouldn't have any protection from temperature swings. So during a heat, heating cycle, your pressure could rise to the point where your, um, your PRV could begin leaking, which would be a telltale sign that you better check your expansion tank. Another way of checking too would be to uh, check that uh, Schrader valve. And if you have air coming out, you're good. But if you have water coming out, you know, just press that little button on your Schrader valve. If you have fluid coming out, then water coming out, then uh, you, you have a bad tank. Perfect, good question. With that, thanks Kevin and team and everybody have a good rest of the day and uh, we'll talk to you again soon. Bye-bye.